Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Kathy. Great tips on parenting. And I want you to know, too, that Laura will be available with her prayer counselors after each session because as we finish, um, many times I will just say the prayer counselors will be up front. And if you uh, feel that you would like to come up and pray about one of the issues that maybe we've touched on, please feel free to do that. I'll tell you, there's a great temptation to jump right into the story of Abraham with all that is going on in the Middle East right now. Um, because as, you, as, as this Genesis unfolds, you're going to be absolutely amazed at how it has reached into the 21st century as we research um, what is happening today in comparison with what, was, what transpired then. But I'm going to hold off, and we have a wonderful chapter to do today. And we're going to talk today about a striking resemblance. Last week we saw that from a creative single, one single creative force, that a complex ecosystem was designed to support life in every, every life form in every habitat, from creatures of the deep to animals that creep on the earth to the birds of the air. Today we come to the sixth day. We went days one through five last week. All the preceding days were anticipation of this day like getting ready for Christmas. You know how you, you bake and freeze and how you go shopping? How many of you shopped already for Christmas? Look at this. Amazing. And you wrap and you just do all this stuff to get ready for what? One day. Well, I want you to know that everything that God did prior to this time was in anticipation of this day. It was his Christmas. It was the ultimate point because he was going to create man. But before he does, he populates the earth with a great many animals. So there is the creation of animal life, and we know that they are classed by species because he said they would be created after their own kind. He divides them into three categories, domestic animals, wild animals, and crawling animals, which would be all kinds of reptiles, snakes, uh, lizards, everything that crawls on the ground. Once he has done that, it's as if that isn't enough. Now we're ready. And now he creates man. But there's a huge difference between the creation of man and the creation of the animal life. Because the creation of man has a, is very personal. It's the first time that God uses in the creative process a personal pronoun. He says, let us make. And if you go back to verse 24, it says, And God said, let the land produce living creatures, or let there be. Then you jump to verse 26 and God said, let us make. Well, there's, first of all, there's two things we need to see in that. First of all, it's a plural. Us is plural, a plural pronoun. So God is speaking about himself, the Holy Spirit, and the Son of God, at this point, who is called the Word. He is, they are all three involved in the creation of this man. Let us make, plural. Not let there be, but let us make. It is also, when you think about the the let us, or let there be, it's the voice of authority. But when you think about the words, let us make, it's as if someone has affection. Um, how many of you said to your husbands, let's make a baby? Yeah, let us make a baby, right? Sure, it's very personal. It's not, let there be a baby. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not the voice of authority. It's very personal. Don't get into how personal. Today, I hear mom saying, we are pregnant. I love that. And I kind of look around to see who else she's talking about. No, no, no. She, she's got the whole idea. We are pregnant because this is a twosome deal. This is my husband and this is myself. We, we have created this life. We are pregnant. And you know something? How we use our pronouns is probably the clearest revelation of how we think because pronouns show ownership, and they show inclusion. God says, let us make. It's the inclusion. It also is ownership. It's personal. Second of all, he says, I give you. Now, I want to just say something here. Chapter 1 is the male account of creation. It's succinct. Just the bare facts. Chapter 2 is the female version of creation. It's got all the goodies in it. All the details. There are not two creations. No. Chapter 2, it's as if we get to chapter 2 and God says, oh, we need a female view on this. We need a little more detail here. 
right? Men give you just the bare essentials. You hear it from a female, you get all the information. So now we see what really happened in chapter 2. He says, um, let us make, but he also goes on to tell how, which we'll talk about in a minute. He says, I give you. We're still back in chapter, two, verse, or chapter 1, verse 29. And God says, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth. Every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. It's the first gift I give you, personal. I give to you, very personal. Thirdly, I don't know that this is in your notes, but it's important to note that when we get to chapter 2, there's a difference in how God is named. Did anybody notice that? In the first chapter, we see that his name is Elohim. We talked about that last week. Very powerful God. All right. When we get to chapter 2, what do we see? Lord God. Lord is Yahweh. The name that God uses every single time he makes covenant with man. Every time he tries to build a bridge and make a relationship with man, he uses that name. Yahweh. This is Yahweh Elohim made man in his image. Very important distinction. How very personal this creation is. Uh, from the very beginning, I want relationship with you. Second way that it is very personal is that not only does he use personal pronouns and a very personal name, he uses his hands. Now, he says, and we need to read it here in verse 7. He says, the Lord God, or Yahweh, Elohim, formed man from the dust of the ground. Now, the word formed is the word yatsar, which in, did any of you remember from two years ago when we did the study on the potter? Remember, that is a word that has to do with forming pottery. So, brought my Play-Doh today. And I want you to know that what he did was, he, Yatsar actually means to squeeze into shape. So, if you can visualize God just scooping up enough clay, I'm sh he easily could have gotten it from my backyard. My stuff adheres so well. It's so compacted. But he begins to form and shape this wonderful creation man. Now, we could say that God Yatsard us from the dust. Scientists have discovered that man's composition is the very same ingredients that are found in the soil and the rock, the limestone of the earth. Our makeup has the very same ingredients as that which is found in the earth. Isn't that amazing? And what, here, I want you to think about the creation. Look to the skeleton and the framework of bones of various shapes and sizes so disposed and adjusted as not only to impart solidarity to the corporal structure, but to form a safe receptacle for the vital parts. While the arms and the limbs, attached by joints like hinges, and the vast number of small bones which are placed in the extremities, conduce to flexibility and ease of motion. Think about the muscular and nervous cords, which intersect the body like a net, meshes of a net, respectively perform important functions, repairing what is waste, forming the secretions, and circulating the fluids which are necessary for digestion and lubrication, sustaining the whole system in healthiness and activity. Consider the mechanism with which is provided for communication and external nature of mankind and for the world around it. And then there is the hand, that which is of such indispensable utility for the purposes of personal convenience or industrial action. There is the eye that is capable of discerning objects, whether near or remote, and revealing wonders of the material universe. The ear that catches every variety of sound forms the medium of holding conversation with friends, as well as receiving intelligence from instructors, bringing to us sweet melodies that delight or soothe, as well as the harsh notes of danger. And I could go on and on. This marvelous creation that we are. But God doesn't stop there. He has formed us. He has squeezed man into shape. Then he takes his own breath and breathes into man. At that point, the spirit enters into man. The heart begins to beat. Let me tell you something about the heart. This living being has a heart that beats between 60 and 70 times a minute. That's 93,000 times each year. 
and you don't even think about it, do you? 655,000 times per week, I'm sorry, 93,000 times per day, 655,000 times per week, 34 million times per year, and 2.4 billion beats in the average lifetime. As we sit here, think of all the beating that is going on, and we don't have to do a thing about it. It just goes. Then, the heart of man, from a functional viewpoint, is a miracle of performance. Through a complex nervous and hormonal feedback regulation system, the heart and circulatory system maintain the exact correct rate in output to supply the correct blood flow for both the marathoner and the couch potato. Your nervous system is also marvelously complex. It has the ability to communicate the feel of pain resulting from intense pressure, yet adapts appropriately to the pressure of sitting or standing without distracting neural traffic. And by the way, your red blood cells, which incidentally happen to be, according to evolutionists, the ideal shape for transporting oxygen, are manufactured and destroyed at an incredible rate. Approximately 10 million red blood cells are made every hour. From the time you got here this morning until the time you go home, over, two, over 20 million red blood cells will be made in your body. And every hour, an equal number are destroyed. If either supply or destruction becomes out of synchrony by as little as 1%, listen to me, if that, if that 10 million isn't made every hour or destroyed every hour by as much as 1% difference, then your life will end due to anemia or polycythemia. Blood clotting is similarly complex, requiring coordinated functions of at least chemical fa 11 chemical factors. Should blood clot too readily or should clots which are formed fail to dissolve, you die. Should it clot too slowly, Again, the result is death. Man's problem, historically, is that we seem to be far too impressed with what we ourselves create and too little impressed with what has been created within us. Now, I want you to imagine a mechanical engineer or even a team of engineers who were tasked with developing a robot that could lift 500 pounds. Imagine that they were separately tasked with designing a robot to play Chopin. Either task, if unrestricted by too many specifications, could easily be accomplished. They could make a robot could do e either of those tasks. However, ask this team to design a machine with a simultaneous capability to do both tasks and restrict their machine weight to 250 pounds. Require that this device be adaptable to the a variety of similar tasks, and the engineering team would probably collectively throw in the towel. Yet. We have simply asked for a very crude replication of the former football player, Mike Reed. Not to say that we have made great, not made great strides in robotics. We know that, and artificial intelligence, but we're a long way. Let me tell you something. We're a long way from replicating this wonderful man's capacity for creativity, for self-repair, for self-programming, for a myriad of other human capabilities, which have somehow miraculously been neatly packaged into a highly durable, mobile bundle weighing typically under 150 pounds and composed of less than $5 of raw material. Amazing. Look at the person next to you and say, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. William Paley once put forth the illustration. Now, I know you're laughing, for I know every one of you, you've got this thought going through your mind, not me. You are. And we're going to get further, you're going to see. William Paley once put forth the illustration that if we were walking along and suddenly came upon a watch, we would assume that indeed there was a watchmaker. We seem perfectly willing to examine our form and function, which is imminently more complex than a timepiece, yet we assume we have no creator. Now let me ask you this. If you just put, if, e if even you put the plants out, if you just laid them out in your yard, and you went away for a week and came back, 
would those plants have assembled themselves into a garden? How about if you went away for um, a year? No. If you went away for a million years, they still would not have transplanted themselves and made themselves into a garden. How about if you took all the pieces of your watch, if you just had all the pieces that were made put in a watch, and you put it in a box, and you shook it, 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 how long before it became a watch? How can we be so blind to think that there is not a mastermind who has created the wondrous workings of our body? Let me, is this fascinating to you? I, I just find this so fast. Take your eye. If we are to believe evolution, it all started with a single-celled organism, which of course have no eyes. So somewhere along the way, the eye must have evolved, right? But the problem is that the eye isn't any good unless you have all of the eye. You can't just have part of it. It won't work. You've got to have all of it. To have 5% of an eye or even 50% of an eye does you no good. You can't see unless you have 100% of the working parts of an eye. With evolution's gradual changes, the question is, what good is 5% of an eye? The answer is it's no good at, all, good at all. Since evolution puts forward the survival of the fittest and the idea that only that which is effective and useful survive, 5% of an eye would have gotten wiped out because it was useless. So listen, listen to what Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, wrote in The Origin of Species. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed that they're doing a whole thing on him on Channel 2 this week. Just, they're doing a whole thing explaining evolution. I mean, we have indoctrinated a world. And there are many of you sitting here that probably have come in thinking that evolution was the way we came to be and you've never brought it into question. I hope that through this study that you n realize and know that we have a creator. This is what Charles Darwin wrote. To suppose that the eye with so many parts all working together could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. At least Darwin got that much right. It is absurd. All right, so man's creation is a wonderful thing. But it goes further. When he made us in his image, there's a huge difference in after his own kind and in his image. Remember, the animals were after their own kind. The plant life was after their own kind. But we are in his image. What is the difference? Well, first of all, it establishes our value. We have equality in God's family. If you go back to the Middle East and you study uh, all the cultures, it was only the kings and the pharaohs who could claim to be in the image of their god or gods. They were the only ones who could say that. I am made in the... And they, they were actually said to have been made or created in the image of his identity. Not one of you. There's no hierarchy. There's not one of us that's any better than anyone else. We are all equal. That puts us all on equal footing. Then we are also unique and tailor-made. We are, we are all alike in that we are made in God's image. We bear his image, but we are all unique. We are, we are custom-made, so to speak. Now, when people see me with Amy, they'll look at me. In fact, when we were in Las Vegas and the closer came out for the condo that she was purchasing and she looked at me and she looked at Amy and she said, oh my goodness, she said, she looks just like you. Now, I don't see that when I look at Amy, but other people see it and they say, she's just like she's in your image. Okay, she looks like me, but she's very different than I am. She's her unique person. She reacts differently to different things. She uh, organizes very differently than I do. <laughs> Say that nicely. <laughs> Even cloning cannot produce, reproduce, listen to me. Even cloning cannot reproduce the same person because we are made in his image and we're each given a unique identity. We are his workmanship. And that workmanship has to do with the breath of God that is in us. It is a unique personality that we are given. Workmanship comes from poema, a Greek word which we get from our English word where we get our word poem. It means that which is made. And the ancient Scots understood this word. The word for poet is maker, 
When God made you, he was a poet. You are one of a kind. You are unique. You are a wonderful poem, so to speak. A masterpiece. We are also the nearest resemblance to God of all the creation. If you take from day one throughout all the magnif magnificent things that we have in creation, you are the closest thing to God. So when people go out and they say, um, I'm going to go find God in nature. Well, I, you can see evidence of his handiwork in nature, but you're not going to see God in nature. You know where you see God? When you look into the eyes of the person next to you, you're going to see at least part of what God intended. Because we see God's handiwork because we are the ones made in his image, not nature. Now, it is, a, it is because of this, it is because he breathed life into us, because we are made in his image, that we are not to take another life. In the aftermath of the World Trade disaster, do you hear anybody talking about the loss of that magnificent, those magnificent buildings? What do you hear them talking about? Huh? People. The loss of life. They, if they could choose, they would destroy all the buildings in New York to save those 6,400-some people. Am I right? Yes. In his image is a wonderful thing because not only does it establish our value, but it gives us the gift of identity. There is no limit on our ability to grow, our ability to communicate, our ability to become. We are given intelligence, first of all. We can think, reason, and communicate just as God thinks. Psalm 92 says, How great are your works, O Lord, how profound your thoughts. We know that God thinks. He doesn't think like we do, according to Isaiah 55, 8. He says, um, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways your ways. But we do know that he has a thinking process as we have a thinking process. Then we are given a personality, and we are endowed with a spirit. It is the essence of who we are. When you go to awake and you see the body lying in the casket, it's just a body. There's nothing that makes you want to sit down and carry on a conversation because there's no life. There's no personality. It's gone. When that person dies, that personality is gone. It has left. And I believe it is part of the whole spirit, soul process that God instilled in us when he breathed in life into us. And by the way, if you think that that happened only once, it does not. If you turn to Psalm 139, it tells us in 130, Psalm 139, verse 15, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me, were written in the book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts to me, O Lord. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1, verse 5, it's, God says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God knew you before you were even formed. He was part of the formation process in what he set into motion. He has given you. Sometime, whether at conception or in the process, there is a life personality that is breathed into that tiny, growing baby that is going to be different from anyone else. You're given a spirit. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, And dust returns to the earth it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. God gives the spirit that is your personality, that is your your life, that is when we die, that's gone. It goes back to God. It just doesn't lay there in the ground. I want you to know that. It is a living thing that will never end. Once you create a child, once you conceive a child, that child, that spirit will live for eternity. Isn't that an amazing thought? So those of you who have miscarriages, I want you to know something. Your baby is with him. I really believe that. I truly do. That spirit will live forever once conceived. Then, he, he, we express our personality through our emotions. God has emotions. He says, I love you. He says, I hate the unrighteous. I hate the unrighteous. I hate sin. He expresses his emotions over and over and again in the word. Thirdly, he gives us autonomy, which is the freedom to choose. Job 24.15 says, if, I, if serving the Lord is under... Joshua 24.15 said, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you'll serve. God gave us that ability to choose, just as he gave Adam and Eve the right to choose in the garden. 
Fourth, he gives us an upright conscience. We are endowed with, endowed with a sense of right and wrong. Now, some people would disagree. They say we learn that in our environment. Let me tell you what Ecclesiastes 7, 20, 29 says. God has made men upright, but each has turned to follow his own downward road. God made us to be upright. He, why is it that man is the only of the animal beings who walks upright? Because God, did you know the word upright is tied to the word uprightness? Sure. Righteous. Uprightness means righteous. God made us to be righteous. It was through our own choice that we chose not to be righteous. But he made us to be upright. And in our walking in an upright position, that in signifies what God's intention was. We're excited when our babies get off the floor, stop crawling, and get up and walk. I mean, that is a day for celebration. Most of you write it down in your baby books. Well, I want you to know, link that. Link that day with your walking upright with God when you accept him as your Lord and Savior. Because that uprightness is what he intended you to be. So Romans 2.12 says God will punish sin wherever it is found. He will punish the heathen when they sin even though they never had God's written laws for down in their hearts they know right from wrong. God's laws are written within them and their own conscience accuses them or sometimes excuses them. God put within us a sense of what was right and wrong. That is instilled within our being. We can desensitize that. We can walk away from it but he instilled it within us. C.S. Lewis said, whatever else is true of man, it's certainly true that man is not what he was meant to be. Isn't that the truth? It's amazing when you think of Osama bin Laden was made in the image of God, and God intended him to use that genius to serve him. Whenever I see someone who is extremely gifted or talented, and they are just bent on destruction or bent on evil, I, I pray for them because I think God intended that brilliance to be used for his kingdom. In his image also, I want you to know, confirms the existence of the creator because image is translated shadow in the Hebrew. Now when you see a shadow, you know that there is a very tangible object that is casting that shadow. You are the shadow of God. You cast the image of God. You are proof that he exists. Just as we went back and I showed you all the many ways. But I believe that too, since we know that there is a creator, we will have to answer, answer to him for our devaluation of human life. Today, euthanasia laws have been passed in some states to end the life of the elderly or terminally ill. Between two and four million women are abused physically every single year. Abuse of the elderly is a growing concern and numbers nearly 2 million victims a year. As of 1998, 37 million babies had been aborted in America. Had they been named, their names would have filled 700 Vietnam War memorial walls or 5,781 World Trade Center disasters. Does that help you get a grip on what we have done? I really truly believe that it is what we have taught our children through evolution that because if there is no creator, there is no right or wrong. If there is no creator, life doesn't really matter. It doesn't have value. And I do believe that we are answering in the violence today to the creator today. Then he gives us commands to carry out. And through doing that, he gives us a, the gift of purpose. So he gives us the gift of identity because we're made in the image of God. When he gives the commands, he says, God, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply in number and fill the earth. This gives us the gift of purpose. Now, the word blessing here is linked to creating. And the original mean, uh, meaning of the word blessing here was fertility. It was not a command in, in the sense that you have to go and do it, but it was rather giving the ability to reproduce. I'm going to let you have children. Now, there are two things that have brought incredible joy into my life. The first is bearing children. I, the wonder of holding those babies for the first time. I, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it, whether you are an adoptive mother or whether you are a natural mother. 
you put that baby in your arm, it is an incredible feeling. You look and you just think, oh, there has to be a God. As you look at the eyes and the ears and the perfect little fingers and the tiny little toes. I had Lisa. Where, where are you, Lisa? Did she leave? Do you have your baby? Bring her up. I just, I just want you to look at this. Oh, sleeping. Of course. Should have chosen one that was awake. When you, when, you are, when you look at that tiny, tiny baby, what a blessing it is that he has given us to reproduce. What's your baby's name? Juliet. Juliet. I'm going to pull off a sock here. Juliet. I don't care. I want you to look at those tiny little toes, how perfectly they're formed, and the little fingers. And if you could just see her little face. I mean, it is just such a wonder. It is such a wonder. Thanks, Lisa. Be fruitful and multiply is a, is a wonderful blessing from God. So when he's, the Lord blessed them, he blessed them by giving them the, the ability to reproduce. Now, the second thing that has brought great joy into my life is seeing people coming to the kingdom of God, the second birth. Now, how many of you know Tom Trzinski, one of our pastors? Tom is always joyful. I don't think I've ever seen him not absolutely joyful. Carmen, do you ever see him absolutely not joyful? Carmen is his wife. You know, I think one of the reasons Tom is so joyful is that he is almost on a daily basis introducing people and bringing them to Jesus Christ. There is an incredible joy that floods your spirit when you are involved in that spiritual reproduction. Then, secondly, not only does he give us the ability to reproduce, but he says, in verse 28, continue, he said, Subdue the earth, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living creature that moves on the ground. So, number one, you need to exercise the authority that is yours. Now, God introduces Adam to his, to his ability to be an authority by bringing the animals to him and says, name them. You don't name something that you don't have authority over. I, d asked, I asked Lisa, what's the name of your baby? Did, did somebody else name your baby or did you and your husband name your baby, Lisa? Yeah, okay. She's in charge. She's the authority in that child's life. We name what we have authority over. If you're starting a company, you're the owner, you, you name the company. You don't go out and say, well, what do you think we should name our company? Oh, you decide what it's going to be. You name your children. When our babies were born, it took us a while to decide on names. You know, there were two of them, and so it took a lot longer. By the third day, people were starting to get worried. And the doctor had named them himself. He called them thing one and thing two. So exercise the authority that is yours. Then employ your innate creativity. God gives man dominion over every living thing on the earth, and he's given a superior position on earth. All scientific and technological advances, every feat of engineering, every new scrap of knowledge about the nature and function of the universe is an outworking of that dominion that he has given us. You can make anything you want, the teachers say. to break out of the, we've always done it that way, rut, rut and it helps, helps us be able to mend relationships with a funny card or an apple strudel. It gives courage to try a new job, a poetry class, cross-country cross skiing, and it brings us closer to our own creator. So, exercise the creativity that's within you. Secondly, exert order in your domain. Now, domain is where you live. Do you see how close it is to the word dominion? To have dominion over. Dominion means to have rule and control over. So look at your house as your domain, the area that God has given you to have dominion over, and keep it tidy. Keep your little plot as tidy as you can, as orderly as you can. I saw um, uh, Michelle came this morning with like probably eight bags full of toys for our nursery. And I had the privilege of helping her carry them down with her children. And I said to the kids, do you have anything left at home? <laughs> there were so many toys. But what a great thing. She said, you know what? These toys are really below my children's level. So it's a good thing to get them out. You know, that's what it means to keep order. Get rid of what you don't need. Give it away to somebody who needs it. Share it. And, and you have the joy of giving. 
And you also get a clean playroom for a while. <laughs> so in exert, exert order in your domain. Then we're entrusted with the stewardship of our creation. And I would just say one, four little words. Leave it better than you found it. When I, I do it in such simple ways. When I go into the bathroom and there's toilet paper on the floor, I pick it up. I know it's not my toilet paper. But you know what? My husband has so drilled those words into my life that I can't, I can't walk down the hallway without seeing a people pay, piece of paper and picking it up. Would you pick it up at home? Yeah. When I'm subbing in the schools, I pick up stuff on the ground. You know what? Your children will see you, and because they are made in your image, and you are imprinting on them, things they will do the same thing. But this, so God makes us in His image. He He creates man in a wonderful, wonderful way. But the second thing He does, He ends the day by starting the Sabbath, and it's a call to rest. I want you to know the Sabbath is an invitation. At this point, it is not a command. And I think as Christians, it becomes an invitation to us today as well. Before sin, it was an invitation. He says, remember the day of completion. Verse 31 says, then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. Notice that before, he always said it was good. But when he got through with man he's, and woman, woman, he said, it is very good. The completeness of creation is emphasized by the statement, and he rested. The Sabbath was the seventh day of the week until the resurrection of Jesus because it was the day of completion. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose on the first day. So we celebrate the Sabbath on the first day of the week. Why? Because we celebrate the completion of the atoning work that he did for us on the cross. That's why it's an invitation. The second thing I would say about Sabbath is that, oh, and by the way, that it's a wonderful day to remember that you belong to the Creator. I like what uh, M. Tzvat says. He says the Sabbath is a day in which he hands his life back to God every week to remember it is not his own. It's just a remembering day. And then secondly, the Sabbath is an invitation to recapture the Garden of Eden. This morning I was listening to um, one of the morning shows and they were talking about biological warfare and all the ways that it come to our country. I don't know about you, but I've been talking to people who have had trouble sleeping, and maybe some of you are here. You're struggling with, how is this going to affect my children, and what should I do? Should we go out and buy gas masks and carry them around with us all the time like they do in Israel? What should we do? I want to suggest to you that you do what one black woman ex did. She said, when I works, I works hard. When I sits, I sits loose. And when I worries, I go to sleep. I'm, re I'm being very serious today. I want you to invite and remember, invite the Garden of Eden into your life. Invite rest into your life. God rested even though he knew what was coming, that Adam and Eve were going to fall, that they were going to sin, that they were going to walk away from him. He rested even though he could, have, he could have been anxious about that. He could have tried to prevent it, but he rested. And I think that he did not waste one anxious moment, but enjoyed the stillness and the rest of the day. I would suggest to you that in all that has happened, that you do the same thing, that you enjoy the rest that God has given to us. And I want to, you to know that it says in the New Testament that we are his workmanship, that all of the creation at creation, including man, was wonderful, but there's no creation so wonderful as what happens when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Then we become Christ's workmanship. If you haven't done that today, I would suggest that you do that as we close in prayer. And I'm going to ask my prayer counselors to come forward. And I do believe that some of you, you might have... Uh, an issue where you do not believe that you are valuable and unique and you've struggled. Let's get that settled today. Some of you have something in your past in terms of um, a devaluation of life that needs to be resolved today, that needs to be forgiven so you can walk free of any condemnation today. Others of you have not learned how to rest and you are anxious about everything that has happened and everything that will happen. I want you to put that at rest today and invite the Garden of Eden back into your life. So as I'm praying, would you just feel free to come forward 
and come for prayer, and we'll close in that manner. Thank you, Father, this morning. Oh, God, when I think of your creation and how you are mindful of man, it amazes me. When I think of how fearfully and wonderfully we are made, of just what has transpired in our bodies as we have sat here this morning. I acknowledge you as my creator. And I thank you, Father. Help me to have an awareness of the wonder of life. When I look at my child, I pray that my words will reaffirm to them their uniqueness and their wonder in your eyes. Father, if there is a woman here this morning, a mom here, who is struggling with her value, I think of the mom from Texas who called her five children into the bathroom and one by one explained to them that she didn't think she was a very good mom and she didn't think much of herself because she was such a terrible mom she had to take their life and then drown them one by one. I know that there are pressures on moms. But Father, you didn't call us to be perfect. You just called us to walk in truth. And the truth is that we're made in your image today. Help us to realize that. To value the life that you have given to us personally. And then Father, I pray that you'll help us to get back to the rest that you've called us to. To understand the purpose you've called us to and the rest. And for those moms that are anxious this morning and are living in fear, God, I just pray that you'll just pour your spirit out upon them and that they will experience the rest of the Garden of Eden. Thank you for the Sabbath. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, feel free to come forward for prayer or pray at your tables if you would like, and we'll see you next week.